All righty, we have been in this incredible series, and uh, uh, I think we got this week and next week, and then we will be done asking the question, why? And uh, if you have your Bibles uh, with you, or if you have the app with uh, the sermon notes in them, you can go there in the app, and uh, or if you, you know, have your Bible, uh, you know, Bible app open, let's go to a very familiar verse, probably one of the most famous verses uh, in Scripture that many people are familiar with, and it is truly the foundation of uh, what we know God's love is for the world. And it says this, John 3, verse 16. Can we read this together? Yeah. Are, are you okay with that? Yeah. Let's read it like we're excited to read. Are you okay? Yeah. So not like, for God so loved the world. Can we get excited about it? Yeah. All right, let's do one, two, three. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let's read the next verse. Are you ready? Are you ready? Uh, is it on there? Okay, one, two, three. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Wow, what, what an incredible message we have to the world. That God has not come to condemn you, but God has come to save you. And uh, we've been talking uh, about the understanding that we have, the, not just the what, but the why. And, and really, it deals with the inside of us. It deals with the, uh, 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 not just knowing the information, but why, why we do what we do as a church, why we do what we do as a Christ follower. It deals literally with the motivation of our heart because we are beginning to understand that God is not just interested in you doing the right thing. He's interested in you doing the right thing for the right reason. And, uh, and that we understand, because how many of you know that there are some of us, not in this room, not online, in other parts of the world, who can do things, uh, the right things, but it has the wrong motivation? As a matter of fact, let, if you just go to Scripture, you'll find that throughout Scripture, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, the Sadducees, because they were sad, you see, they, uh, uh, they continually did the right thing. They followed the law, but how many of you know their hearts were far removed from God? Uh, they did the right stuff. They, they obeyed the law, but they were miserable, and they made other people more miserable. As a matter of fact, when Jesus speaks out the woes to the Pharisees, he, he literally goes for the juggler, and he says, he says, you guys, he says, you will travel the world. You get on a ship. You travel the world to distant countries to make one convert, and then you make that person as miserable as you are. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, you make them a convert of hell. I mean, how many of you know that's pretty direct, right? And, and, and so it's all why, because they followed the letter of the law, but not understanding the reason why. And the reason why the law was given was to show us that we can't do it in ourselves, because none of us can obey the law. We needed what everybody needs, and what's that? That's the grace of God. That's the love of God. Love is our why. Turn to your neighbor and say, love is my why. Say it again. Love is my why, and that is expressed in generosity. You don't have to say that. Our love is not a stagnant feeling, but it is a generous act of sacrifice. I don't know if you ever heard that great spiritual song, Love Hurts. Anybody ever heard? Love hurts. Are you? Love scars. Love wounds. And mods my heart. Anybody? Something just came out of me. I don't know what it was. But the, what we have to understand that the sentiment of, of, the, of that song is that love produces pain. But I want you to understand the, the understanding of that is it is a pain because I, I love someone, but they don't love me back. So therefore it scars me. But how many of you know that God's love has got nothing to do with loving and not loving back? God's love has to do with loving and keeping on loving and keeping on loving and keeping on loving. Because God's love is a sacrificial love. Yes, God's love does hurt, but it hurts God more than it hurts us. Why? The Father's love for us is expressed by the greatest act of generosity brought about by the most excruciating, excruciating way possible. The Son of Man hanging on a cross undeserving yet willing to pay the ultimate price for the freedom of all mankind and the redemption of the earth from the influence and control of the evil ones. Jesus' love for us cost him his life. 
So generous is God's love towards us that He did not wait to express His love until we accepted or acted right or became right. Jesus willingly dies for evil people who then has the choice to accept sacrificial love or reject it. No one will one day be able to point to Jesus and say, you did not love me enough because His love is expressed by His gift of Himself for humanity. So now, his sons and daughters, he expects us to love others in the same way. So so if we're going to love others in the same way, it's going to look like something. So we've been kind of dealing with this. And to be generous in love, we said this, that we must adopt the correct life. I'm going to excommunicate you. Because there's been a false spirit that's been propagated while I was gone. About stance. Let's get it right once and for all. It is stance. Turn to your neighbor, you better say stance. All right. The young buck is trying to give you false teaching and been trying to help him. We have to adopt the correct life. Beautiful. We got to get rid of emotional garbage. That's what I'm doing now about this life stance. You got to stay on mission. Anybody remember that? You can desire the best for others. You got to dump worry like the bad habit it is. And you got to learn the remedy for complaining. Pastor Landon so beautifully did that last week. Today uh, and next week, I want to just share with you a thought that is going to be a little bit challenging, but I believe it's necessary because it's going to help us to love others the right way. To be generous in love towards others, we must put stuff in perspective. We must put stuff in perspective. Now, I want you, uh, like uh, we've been going through the book of Philippians and, and, you know, not line upon line, but basically line upon line in our way. Uh, Philippians 4 verse 11, I want you to check this out. Listen to what Paul writes. Not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation. Let me ask you a question. You don't have to answer it online. You don't have to answer it outside. You don't have to answer it inside. You don't have to answer it. But let me just ask you a question that you can ponder for a moment. Have you learned the secret of living in every situation? And then he goes on and it says, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. And then the verse that we always quote out of context, verse 13, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. So Paul is saying I've learned contentment because it's a learned thing. And the ability, I I, want to say these words to you because, you know, I I believe that we are feeling the pressure of what's going on in in our nation and not only in our nation, in the world. We can see things are not the way that it, that, that, that it is. And it's kind of like standing on water, which we can't do. But it's kind of like we are, we are, we are moving back and forth, back and forth. And we, there's, no, there's no secure footing. And if you're going to have a secure footing, you must, you must learn this. The ability to discern between what is needed and what is wanted. And when you're able to discern that, that will save all of us a lot of heartache and a lot of stress. Our stress levels are elevated as our want levels increase. I'm just going to let that sink in for a moment. The more we fail to discern what is needed and what is wanted, the more we will lack perspective to be able to be content in any and all situations. That's why Jesus warned us about what master we bow down to because our servitude to whatever master we serve will then govern our love and our devotion or it will feel our hate and our abhorrence. Now the question then I, if, if we want to ask ourselves and I'll just look down, I won't look at you so you know I'm not directing it at you but to you, all right? How do you know which master you are serving? The one you struggle to let go of. The one that you constantly think about and the one that occupies most of your time. You cannot be consumed with stuff 
and experience joy at the same time. If you have no joy in your life, loving people becomes more difficult. Why? Because the more joyful and the, the more capacity you will have to bear under difficult circumstances. The more you are consumed about things, the less joyful and less loving you become. Jesus actually tells us we become enslaved to stuff and that produces a prison of our own demise. And if you don't believe me, look at this verse that we've looked at before. But I want you to look at it again, Matthew 6, 24. No one, somebody say no one. No, no one can what? Serve. Can serve two masters. For you will hate one and you will what? Hate one and you'll be and what? So do you see the balance here? Love, hate, devoted, despised. And then Jesus tells you what he's talking about. You cannot what? Serve God and be what? Enslaved to money. That is why I tell you not to worry about what? Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? And I think that we have to answer, isn't your life more than the stuff you possess? You see, Jesus warned us not to allow the need for things to become the driving force of our lives. He knows we need things, and he knows that we have a tendency not to have the right perspective about stuff, about things, so he warns us. And he warns us so succinctly, so beautifully. I want you to go with me to Luke chapter 12 as we dig the foundation of this today. Uh, I want you to notice Luke 12 verse 13. Then someone from the crowd called out, Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. So this is right after Jesus talked about this. Then look at verse 14. Jesus replied, Friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? How many of you know some things we have no business in trying to decide? Are you with me? So, so he says, uh, 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 teacher, my brother is cheating me on the inheritance. Uh, Jesus says, uh, uh, why? I'm not the arbitrator. I'm not the judge about this. Then, then, then he said, watch this. Then he said, Jesus, verse 15. Then he said, somebody say, then he said. Beware. Somebody say, Beware. Now watch these words, God against every kind of greed. You see, the moment you talk about greed, the moment you say greed, none of us think that we are greedy. Can I tell you what we think about greed? We think greed starts where our income ends. I need to say that again. We think greed starts where our income ends. If you make $50,000 a year, you don't think you're greedy, but the guy that makes 100000 now, he might have a problem with greed. If you make, make $150,000 a year, you don't have a problem with greed because, I mean, you work hard for your money, so hard, funny, funny. <laughs> and they never treat you right. But you don't have a problem with greed. It's the guy that makes $250,000 a year. Uh, did you hear what I said? Yeah. Yeah. Is that greed for us is, we are never greedy, but someone who makes more than us, they might be greedy. I want you to know that you can be as broke as anything and be as greedy as everything. Greed has got nothing to do with how much you have. It has got everything to do with what has you. And when you understand that, that you can have a greedy heart while having a needy heart, then that will be, begin, begin to help you to establish, to understand that you've got to put the stuff that you have in your life in perspective. Because Jesus will warn you. Because now listen to what Jesus said. This is the words of our master. Beware, God against every kind of greed. And then listen to these words. We ought to write this part of the verse down. Life is not measured by how much you own. See, today we say we have winners and we have losers. And winners are always those who have something. That's what we think. We think that in terms of somebody who don't have a lot of money, they might not be very successful. Well, in whose economy? Maybe in a natural economy, but not in God's economy. 
So, because we measure life with things, and Jesus says, when I measure, I don't put it around your stuff, I put it around your heart. Because you can have a lot of stuff, but what it is, is you don't have the stuff, the stuff has you. How do you know? Because you're unwilling to let go of the stuff. Then he told them, I'm not done, I'm just starting. (laughs) Then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all my crops. Then he said, I know, I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I'll have room enough to store all my wheat and other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, listen to how he's talking to himself. My friend, he calls himself his own friend, that's pretty good. My friend. You have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, I want you to notice the self-conversation because you can have a self-conversation that that you think that it's the right conversation, but you must remember that while you have a self-conversation, there is a conversation that's higher than your self-conversation, and that's God's conversation. Because you can say, but let's now see what God says. But God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? And then Jesus doesn't stop. Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but have no Rich relationship with God, or the, as, as the other translations said, are not rich toward God, meaning that they are rich towards themselves, but they are not generous towards the things of God. Then turning to his disciples, now Jesus is going he's gonna to take this to the end. Jesus said, that's why, somebody say, that's why. that's why. I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food to eat or enough clothes to wear, for life is more than, and your body more than. Life is more than the things we possess, and we must have the right perspective on things. If you cannot let go of things, then you are a slave to those things, and you are enslaved by those things. The fear of not having things might just simply be an indication that our treasure is in the wrong place. I'm going to make a statement, and I think the statement is on the overhead, because I I thought while I was writing this, I felt that this was really something the Lord wanted wanted to get home here, and that's this. The fear of not having has driven many people to hold on to that which they actually need to let go of and causes them to cling to that which cannot satisfy. Because we're afraid and now the more we hear the news of an economy that might be in danger, suddenly our generosity goes from an open hand to a closed fist. Because now we think the only way to have is to keep. But in God's economy, it's when, when there's famine in the land, then we sow. Why? Because then you truly prove who is believing and who is not. Many Christians are saying with their actions, not their mouths, that money and possessions gives them security, whereas our only security should be in Jesus. Don't worry about losing money. Concern yourself with pleasing the Lord. I want to make another statement. This is, while I was preparing this, I just felt, and I prayed a prayer for all of us. And this was my prayer. I pray that the church would rather pursue that which cannot be purchased to possess that which cannot be sold to have that which cannot be taken away. That's my prayer for our, for our church. That's my prayer for you. I pray that you, that me, that us, the church, would rather pursue that which cannot be purchased, the goodness of God, to possess that which cannot be sold, His mercy, to have that which cannot be taken away, King Jesus. We never have to fear the loss of things when our hope in Him is the one who is eternal. 
The problem with today's church, and I say this in a general way, unlike the early church, is we have more things, we have more buildings, we have more resources, but yet our influence is diminishing in a world that desperately needs to see what is real. There are many problems that money will never be able to solve and only a kingdom-minded, Holy Spirit-empowered, God-fearing saint will possess that which needs to be given. I want you to go with me real quick to Acts chapter 3. And, I, and, and I, I'm, I'm asking myself this question, is what kind of Christian am I? What kind of believer? This is, not a, this is not something directed at you. This is something that we are taking this journey together. And I want you to note in the early church, Acts 3 verse 1. Shall we read this together? Look at this. Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the 3 o'clock prayer service. We can't even get people to come to the 6 o'clock worship service. But anyway, there is one. You can fix that tonight. Hello. It's a little prompt. As they approached the rock church, I mean the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called Beautiful Gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, look at us. The lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting what? Some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. All the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. This was loud. When they realized he was the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. They all rushed out in amazement to Solomon's coronade where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. Silver and gold we do not have. But what you need is what we do have. The name and power of Jesus. You see, when your desire for the kingdom outshines and outpaces your desire for things, you might, just might be going in the right direction. A lack of resources is not the worst thing that can happen to any of us. Lacking God's power when it is needed is far worse. We have a world that are lame. And they're sitting by our front door. And we want to hand them silver and gold that doesn't change them. But what we do have is the name above every other name. The name of Jesus. So we are afraid to step out in that name and give to people that money will never be able to give. Yeah. Yeah. I'm afraid that the church in general are more interested in what we wear and our sneakers and our hats and our clothing and our watches and our houses than we are in that which we actually possess, which is the name above every name. I want you to understand something, that when you truly possess the name, that means you come in the authority. You see, we think to have authority, uh, this is where we know we've lost it, because we think by repeating the name when we pray, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, that just shows you don't understand the authority that's in that name. And you are just like unbelievers according to Jesus that use vain repetition thinking that in vain repetition you get an answer but when you truly know what is in the name and when you truly know what is being represented you see Peter did not have maybe what you have he didn't have a dime to give the man but that's not what the man needed why because everybody gave him money and he was still in the same position what he needed was something that only the name of Jesus could give him. 
and there are people in our world. I am telling you right now, stop measuring your life by how much money you make and how much money you have and how much money you're going to make. Stop that. That's not the measure of your life. The measure of your life and that which you truly possess is that you have the name of Jesus in your life to speak words to those who are crippled and lame so that they can be strengthened and healed and made whole. We must learn to put stuff in perspective. We must learn to understand. Now, are you saying, Henny, we don't need money? Well, if you think I say that, then you're stupid. <laughs> I, I didn't mean that in an offensive way, but maybe I did. <laughs> How many of you understand that? Yes, sometimes there's an appearance when you look at our church, we do everything that, that we believe God tells us to do. But I want you to know, we don't do it from a wealthy position. We are broke a lot of times. A lot of times we, we, I look at the financial team and what are we going to do? They know what my next words are. What is my next words? We're going to trust God. We're going to trust God. Well, let's, let's put pressure on the people. No, I won't. I'm going to teach the word. And I'm going to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to people and let the Holy Spirit train people. Why? Because if I use pressure to get something out of you, you'll give it through guilt and manipulation. You'll do it maybe once, maybe twice. But if the Holy Spirit works on your heart and deals with your greediness, then just maybe you change your heart and just maybe you'll start obeying God and doing what is necessary so that we can preach the gospel to everyone every creature in all the world. Because this is what I know, the gospel will be preached. We must understand that don't be fooled by the appearance of something. You have to know the substance of something. And here's the problem. We have sometimes the substance of resources, but we don't have the substance of the name. Because we speak the name of Jesus, but yet nobody gets touched. We preach eloquent sermons, yet nobody has changed. And I'm just wondering out loud with you, this congregation that God has called us to lead, if we are not coming to a place in our lives where we are getting tired of being sick and tired of searching after things that never satisfy. If I can get that job and make that money, I'm going to be happy. I want you to know you won't. If you're not happy when you broke, you will not be happy when you are full. Because joy and happiness is not a product of wealth. It is a product of the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. We are entering into a season in the church where those who truly possess the authority will be known. And they might not have the platform. They might not have the silver and the gold. But what they do possess, they are going to give. And we are going to see the very things that we desire to see because God is about to breathe on his house. And I'm prophetically speaking to you, church. Let me say this to you. Next year, even though it might be tough economically, it's going to give us an incredible opportunity to reach people for Christ. Yes. Yes. This is a known fact. This is not a prophecy. This is a known fact that when economic pressure hits people, especially in the U.S., there are three things they go for. Guess what three attendances go up? Number one, bar attendances. Because yeah. people drink more. Yeah. You know why? Because they want to escape. Yeah. And they think that alcohol will give them the release or the relief. 
And then guess what? The second thing goes up is movie attendance. You know why movie attendance? Because people want to get out of their reality. They want to escape to another reality. And then the third thing that goes, that goes up is church attendance. Suddenly, all those who are not coming right now will be coming. It's amazing in 2007 and 2008, we didn't have to ask for volunteers. We had volunteers coming out of our noses. People wanted to volunteer every day. They begged us, can I come to the church? Can I serve? Why? Because they had no other job and they only had God to. I'm saying whether you have or don't have, you should always have that attitude. You see, so why, so why am I saying this? I'm saying because as, what are people looking for? They are looking for answers. But yes, will be the sad thing. We meet people's natural need without giving them what they really need. We give them the silver and gold. We feed them. We clothe them. But we don't give them what they need. And that's the name of Jesus. So we have rich, crippled people still sitting at the gate. Now they clothed. Now they ate, but they still crippled. May we become a church that stands in the name of Jesus and have the authority to be able to say, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give unto you. I think I'm going to quit. I, I'm not even done through my introduction. But you can't handle it. Leave this place putting the stuff that God's given you in perspective. And don't ever think because you don't have money that your life is worth less. Don't yeah. buy into that cultural garbage yeah. that you have to have money to have joy. Rubbish. Now, money can buy you some happiness. <laughs> right? Yeah. When you're riding on a sea dew in the river. <laughs> yeah! I feel it. I feel it in my fingers. I feel it in my toes. Sure. Sure, money, money can buy you some stuff and some satisfaction. Sure, we're not denying that. We're not saying we don't need money to live. But what we are saying is we want to be very careful that when God knocks on the door and says, Son, daughter, I need that sea do now. I need you to sell that. And I need you to give it to the building program so that we can buy this building. So that we no longer are renters but now owners. I want you to sell that extra house. And I want you to actually, when you do make a profit of selling your house, actually tithe of it. Because I gave you increase. Instead of saying, but God, you don't understand. Houses cost more. You, you think God's unaware of what houses cost? You think he doesn't know? You think when you tell him he's surprised, like, what? Your rent is $5,000? Hey. I better sell a piece of the pearly gates because we got to pay that rent. <laughs> Put stuff in perspective. And have a view of God that's greater than the view that you have of things. And if money is consuming you, then you serving the wrong master. Because it's enslaving you. And you are driven and driven and driven to get, to get, to get. And it's making you more and more miserable. Let's pray. Let's bow our heads this morning online in here. I'm just going to simply ask you. If you have not yet made that decision to invite Christ into your life. Peter makes the statement in the very next chapter. He says, don't look at us as if by our power or our might this man has been made whole. But he says, no faith in the name of Jesus has made him whole. The only name by which you can be saved is the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. There is no other name. It's not Buddha, it's not Muhammad, it's not Hare Krishna, it's not Sang Myung Moon. It's no other name 
Shirley MacLaine is wrong. You ain't coming back as a princess in a palace or a, or a pig in a pond or a toad in a toad pond. It's appointed unto man who wants to die and then the judgment you will face God. And then you'll have to give an account to the one who gave you your life. What did you do with it? And it is not your sin that causes you to be away from God. It is your unbelief in what Jesus did for you. Because Jesus already paid the penalty of the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The remedy is there, but you have to believe in him. You have to believe in that name. You have to believe that there's no other salvation but the name of Jesus. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. So today, in this room, online, outside, I'm going to challenge you. If you've never prayed that prayer, or if you prayed that prayer, but you haven't followed through to invite Christ into your life, and say, you, Lord, come and be my Lord. Be the one in charge. Be my Savior. I would love to pray for you. Online, you, inside, outside. If that's you, while every head is bowed, every eye closed, would you just go ahead and just pop up your hand and let me see it. Put it up high so I can see it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I see that. Thank you, thank you. God bless you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I see it. God bless you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I see that. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, I see that, God bless you, God bless you, thank you, thank you, thank you, I see that, God bless you, God bless you. Online, you do the same, just use the hand raise emoji and we'll acknowledge that. And I want to lead you in a prayer, there's no magic in this prayer, it's just a way of submitting our hearts to Him. Could we all pray this together, please? Pray this, say, Lord Jesus, I confess today with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God is the only name by which I can be saved. I declare today, I believe in what Jesus did for me on the cross, shedding His blood and making a way so that I can know the Father. Forgive me of my past. Give me a fresh start. Jesus, by Your Spirit, let me be born again and enter your kingdom. I declare from this day forward, I will follow you and no other. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. If you believe that, give the Lord a clap offering that he is worthy of today. Oh, come on. Let's rejoice in it. Amen.